that we're dealing with. We see the picture of it in 13, expounded upon in 17. Okay? During that same time, we have this other angel. And this angel here is what we see in Revelation 18, who, through this time period, unites with the earthly messengers to give the last day message. And so we see the earth system played out in these next chapters. Remember the chiastic structure. Chapters 13 and 14 are your centers, real centers. Actually, I would say the center of the center is the first angel's message. Uh, chapter 14, verse 7, worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of water. Because those are the primary issues of the book of Revelation, is worship. Who are you going to worship? And so we see here this fourth angel goes through this time period when he unites with the earthly messengers to expound the message with an addition that the earthly messengers don't have. And we're going to take a look at that. But at some point, we see that there be a close of probation. The, the end time is cut off. 17 talks about how this, the uh, system Babylon was destroyed and those weep for it. We talk about the closing off of here uh, of God's people. So at some point, there's a finishing when it's all done, but they continue to the consummation. And so we see the three angels' messages continuing through, enlightened or it, um, strengthened, empowered by the message of the fourth angel carried to the consummation. Now I'm saying things this way because recently it's been a big thing within our church to talk about revival, reformation, and praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and laddering power. And we know we all use those quotes from Ellen White where we're told to pray for the latter rain. And if all we're going to do is sit around and pray for the latter rain, I think we're going to be very disappointed. There's something more to the latter rain than sitting around and praying for it. It actually has a very de definite purpose. And when we find out what that purpose is, we can plug into it. And then we know why we're praying for the latter rain. It's like, you know, mother sends me to the store. Oh, I need you to go to the store. Quick, go. Well, unless I know what to buy, it's a useless trip, right? I mean, I could buy any kind of food. It'd be okay. But it's not what she wants. It's not what she needs to complete the product or the, the dinner that she's making. There's something on receiving the latter rain that's very specific. I talked about it last time. I'm going to talk about it more in context this time. And I think it's right, it lays at the core of what it is to receive latter rain power. So we have the fourth angel. That's who we're looking at, uniting with the three angels' messages. This fourth angel doesn't operate alone. It operates with the three angels, not the third angel but all three messages that have to go to the end. The loud cry and latter rain are connected to our past experience at Minneapolis in 1888. Are we familiar somewhat with the experience of Minneapolis in 88? In 1888, two young men who were co-editors uh, of the Science Magazine in California had come to present some messages at the general conference session held at Minneapolis that, that, that year. We had about 100 official delegates. That's how small a church we were. You've seen how big the last one was, right? <laughs> we had 100 delegates. And Elliot uh, Wagoner and Alonzo T., Alonzo Trevor Jones presented a message to the church, primarily through Wagoner, though Jones presented some things. And, but the, most of the main message was presented by Wagoner on the subject of righteousness by faith. And what he presented on that was in the context of the debate of the law in Galatians. If you want to, just for, so that you can get the context, some may not be familiar with the text, go to Galatians 2.24. This is the key text that was debated upon between these two young men, primarily Wagner, and the leaders of the church. George Ida Butler, the general conference president, and Uriah Smith, the editor of the Review and Herald. In that, it says that the schoolmaster, referring to the law as a schoolmaster, had been, what, done away with. That we had grown up and that is no longer needed. Galatians 2.24. Excuse me? 
Oh, 220, I said 224? I'm sorry. 324. I mean, I've only known this for 100 years. 324. Therefore, the law has become our tutor just to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. The idea that the law was a tutor, was just a teacher to bring us to Christ. And now that we're to Christ, we don't need the tutor anymore. So what that seems to tell us, that the law was somehow then done away with. You see some of the issues, why it stirred up the blood of George Butler and Smith. You know, because they viewed this, this law in Galatians as the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Whereas our church at that time officially had said, no, this is the ceremonial law, not the Ten Commandments. And this was done away with. The ceremonial law brought us to Christ, and then after it brings us to Christ, it's done away with. It sounds good, but our church, interestingly enough, in its earlier history, and I'm talking about James White, uh, J.H. Wagoner, Ellet's father, and others, had understood this law in Galatians to be the moral law. And I'm going to, I'm not going to leave you straggling. I'm going to bring you to a conclusion for that. But what happened in the, in the 1850s was a man named Pierce comes to Battle Creek, and he says, no, we got a problem with that because if we say that, then we're going to have a hard time establishing the Sabbath. Because that was the big message of the day. Remember, that's present truth, Sabbath issues. And so they had a meeting. J.H., Joseph H. Wagoner, Ellet's father, who had written a book on the atonement, talked about this here. In fact, our other pioneers also had mentioned it in their writings. He didn't stay for the meeting. He left town. But that had then become the official position of the church. And so for some 30, 35 years, that was the official position, the official teaching of the church was the ceremonial law. So here come two young men telling us it's the moral law at a general conference in session. Can you see the fireworks? Two young upstarts, they're in their mid-30s. They're going to tell us what theology we should believe. And us older men who carry the church from means are somehow then left on the sidelines. We've been wrong. A lot of hurt feelings, a lot of pride. You know, who are these young men who are going to tell us what, what the truth is? Ellen White has said to have written something on this and that she had affirmed that it was the ceremonial law. Butler told her that she had written something. Uriah Smith also confirmed it. But she says, I can't find it. She looked through her archives and she can't find it. And at the general conference session, she says, you know, it might be God's providence that I can't find it because maybe what he wants us to do is go to scripture and find the truth for ourselves. Later on, she said something very similar in the early 1900s where she wanted to direct people away from the issues of the daily where they wanted to use her writings to establish orthodoxy within the church. She again said, go to Bible. Don't use me. And so here she begins to lay out that where we should get our orthodoxy is not from her writings, but from scripture and from Bible study. That it was providence, she says, that God would do this and lead us to go back and examine what the scripture says. And she says she didn't agree with everything that the boys were saying, but she agreed with the thrust, with their basic message that they were saying. Now, is it the God, is what they were mentioning, the moral law, is it the moral law? Well, Ellen White affirmed later that it was indeed the moral law and the ceremonial. In essence, it was all law. And just to kind of give you an idea of what Paul's talking about here, go to Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Now, that's the right chapter and verse this time, too, just so that you know. Romans 3, verse 20. Paul has just made an argument why all are under sin. He's about ready to make his big concluding, concluding statement in verse 23. All have sinned and come short or are coming short of the glory of God. He wants to establish the fact that he's preaching the gospel not just to Jews who've had God's word, his law, but to Gentiles also who may have received the law through nature, through the law written upon their heart. So he needs to establish that everybody is subject to, the law, to hearing the gospel of God and is subject to the salvation of Jesus Christ. So he makes that argument. And then he comes to the conclusion, these concluding remarks. And in verse 320, he says, because 
By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Through the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. What's the purpose of the law? Bring knowledge of sin. That's the purpose of the law. So what really Paul is writing about in Galatians when he's talking about the tutor, he's not talking about abolishing law. His statement is simply that the law is not the avenue to salvation. What is the avenue to salvation? Faith. So Paul wasn't doing away with law or disparaging law. He was just trying to get it across that the way is not by the law. He affirms it again in Galatians 3, verse 11. It's evident that it's not by works. Or that could be verse 10. Let me. Is it 11? Okay. He affirms that it's, it's, not, it's not by, you know. In fact, he says it's evident. It's like this is a non sequential, like it should make sense to us. And it's not by works, but it's by faith. And the clearest place that he gives in the, in the contrast between faith and works is I think it's in chapter 2, verse 16 of Galatians, where he gives that out. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I thought I worked that out one time, and that's done in a chiastic structure, just to emphasize the point of contrast between faith and works. And so Minneapolis was a very important turning point in the church in understanding salvation and righteousness. Now, that was important because for 40 years, from 1844 to 1888, we as a church, as a denomination, as a people, with a message for the end time, had saw that we had certain things that were peculiar and different, that made us different, made us stand apart from the other Christians. Those things such as the state of the dead, issues on the second coming of Christ, the Sabbath, the sanctuary doctrine, these things made us different, made us Adventists. And so for 40 years, we emphasized what made us Adventists. Because most of the people we were talking to were already Christians. So it wasn't like we had to preach the gospel to them. We just had to kind of convince them to our brand of theology, our brand of Christianity. But after 40 years, we kind of forgot a little bit about what we were. And now we were confronted again with the question that we had to ask is, what made us Christian? And though while we begin to deal with that, up to about 1920, when the church fell into its fundamentalist period, those are issues we're still dealing with today, coming right out of the periods of, of, the, of the tension within the church from 1957, questions on doctrine that would lead us through into the 50s and 60s, 60s and 70s with the righteousness by faith debates that we had in the church. And by late 70s, early 80s, when we had the debates over the sanctuary doctrine and Ellen White and her quote-unquote plagiarism, things that would upset the church. And we all come back again to the same question about salvation, righteousness. How is a man saved? These issues are not dead. And whether we want to realize it or not, it's 1888 all over again. Right. And these are the issues that are being presented at the end time. Remember when I presented the three angels' messages as the gospel in verity, I showed how they were the gospel, the gospel of salvation. That's the message to be given at this time. And so, again, we come back right back to the issues that are coming out of it. It has everything to do with how we proclaim our message 